you. Thank you very much, Siren. Um, I, well, I was going to start uh, by telling you that smaller is quite clearly always better by, the by, by proof of dogs. Um, I, we've seen some people's pets and pictures up on stage, uh, but uh, you haven't seen mine yet. Uh, this is... Uh, that's smaller. That's bigger. Anyway, this is my dog. Um, she is a miniature dachshund uh, in large at this point, but really she's about so big, and she's adorable, and she's named Ruby. Um, not after the language, it was actually my girlfriend's choice, but a funny story came out of that and asked me about it later. Um, Ruby is the best dog in the world, uh, demonstrably. Uh, here she is tucked up in bed, and, uh, and she's tiny. Therefore, smaller is always better. So, now we've got that sorted. Uh, my name's Son Ash, uh, and I am a developer evangelist from Twilio. Um, who here has heard of Twilio at all before? Quite a few, that's cool to see. Um, for those of you who haven't, um, Twilio is a communications platform. That means we have a whole bunch of APIs that you can use in your applications to do things like send and receive text messages, make or receive phone calls, uh, start video chats, regular chats, and emails, and even fax if you need to. Um, some people still need to, don't worry. Um, if you have built something cool with Twilio, I'd love to hear about it. Come find me afterwards, I'll be in red. Or if you have any questions, if you want to know more also, just come and chat. I'm happy to chat to anyone. Um, but let's talk about making things smaller. Um, and I'm going to start. Uh, I was really pleased, actually, uh, to see in Piotr's talk yesterday uh, this quote. You know, speed in software is probably the most valuable, least valued asset. It's a great quote. It means such a lot. Now, obviously, Piotr was talking about, like, uh, very much at the code level and, and, and very deep into the programs that we write. But I joined uh, the development industry uh, from the front end. I started out as a, as a front end developer uh, and, and worked my way into Rails and Ruby and the rest of the stack. Uh, and so I've always been very uh, interested in and um, focused on web performance because uh, that uh, is the first uh, indication of speed that your users will ever come to. If they just see a loading symbol or a white page, uh, not your website, then they are going to be sad. And that was, that's what makes me sad, seeing anything that looks a little bit like this. Loading and waiting. <sighs> just under two years ago, I moved to Australia. I thought, it's a, it's a wonderful country, but it has some of the worst internet uh, in the world, and I see this quite a lot. Um, ask any of the other Australians in here about our internet. It's, it's shocking. Uh, so I see this a lot, and so it matters to me making things fast, making things get to people's browsers, get to their eyeballs quicker. And so there are a bunch of tools out there in order to measure your web performance, uh, and one I like using is Lighthouse. It's built into Chrome. Uh, it's built into Web Page Test. It's there for you to use. And this is what it looks like uh, run against, say, um, the Ruby uh, website. Uh, and it's quite cool. It gives you a few scores just up the uh, top there uh, in performance and accessibility and, uh, and best practices and SEO and whether you have a progressive web app. And it's really useful. And I like to run this against my own site once in a while. Um, because as a developer evangelist, I don't actually have any kind of production applications running right now, aside from my own blog. And so I'm going to make this blog the fastest thing you can ever see on the internet. That seems reasonable, right? Um, so I ran Lighthouse against it one time. And this is kind of this, where the this story came across. I ran Lighthouse, and these were the scores I got. Ah, uh, yes, 100 for SEO, 100 for best practices, 100 for accessibility. Well done, Phil. Uh, 100 for progressive web app. It works offline. And 99 for performance. I was devastated. <laughs> I'd actually been OK if it had been like 40 for performance. I'd be like, oh, I've got some work to do here. But 99, it was playing with me. And I already did a lot of work to make this fast. It's already, uh, it's, it's HTML. There's very little JavaScript involved. Um, uh, the CSS is actually bundled up inside the head, so you don't even have to download another file for it. It's served over HTTP2, so all the assets can get shot to the browser as soon as possible alongside each other. What could I be doing that didn't get me 100? Because everybody wants 100. <laughs> I wanted it across the board. And so this got me thinking, what am I missing out on? Perhaps, perhaps the site is just too big. So let's talk about gzip. Gzip's been around for ages. It is our compression format of choice for text content on the web. And it works. 
But does it work well enough? It's a question I have for you. So all browsers these days pretty much send this header to your website saying accept encoding gzip, and it says, hey, if you send me a, a compressed file back, I will decompress it for you. Thank you very much. And we can do that. And so we set up our files, our sites, to send um, compressed text content. Uh, this is what my Nginx config looks like. I've over-engineered my blog, by the way. It is a statically generated Jekyll site, uh, served on a DigitalOcean droplet with a custom Nginx front end on it, and then a CDN to serve it out to the world. But the important thing is, gzip is on. But is that good enough? It got me thinking. In fact, I'd heard uh, a bunch of things about gzip and about how, they can, how it can be made, such that... Um, well, so this Nginx config, gzip on, actually makes uh, Nginx itself zip up the content and send it. So it's doing this compression on the fly. And that's what got me thinking, Nginx is doing work for me here. It's taking time. Perhaps that's my one. That time. And so uh, as a over-engineering, personal blog-owning Ruby developer, it was time to write a new gem. Of course. So I wrote the Jekyll gzip gem, which taught me a bunch about how to zip up files uh, in, in Jekyll, uh, in Ruby, in fact. Um, and not only that, uh, indeed, how to write a Jekyll plugin as well. There's five different ways to write a Jekyll plugin, uh, but my favorite are the hooks, because you can just reach into the site as it's being built and do something about it. And so in this case, after the site has been completely written to disk, uh, I then take the, uh, take the whole site and put it into the Jekyll gzip compressor. Uh, and then for each file in the site, we compress it, and to compress it, this is it. This is all we have to do. Uh, because the Zlib library is built into Ruby's standard library and allows us to just open a gzip writer and write that file out to disk, uh, much smaller. Uh, you can see here, actually, we also set the uh, modified time and the original name of the file. Uh, this is to make Nginx happy. Apparently, it doesn't like it if they are different to each file. But the important thing on this is not only that we're doing it at build time for the site. But this little line here, oh yeah, we can use the best compression. <laughs> you see, Zlib has nine levels of compression to turn a text file into a gzip file. Nine levels. Uh, actually, it has, well, it has 10, but zero is don't. Um, <laughs> one is the quickest, nine is the slowest, uh, but one is the least compression, and nine is the most compression. Zlib best compression there is just a shortcut for nine. Uh, and so, I wanted to compare this. I wanted to see how we are going to do if we, if we stop this on-the-fly default level compression that Nginx was doing. Default level is six. Uh, and, we, uh, and, we, and we used the best compression, and we did it ahead of time. So I picked a file that I thought would be interesting to compress and see what happened with, and I picked jQuery, because why not? Uh, uncompressed and unminified jQuery is 271,751 bytes. But if we compress that with gzip by default, we bring it down to 80,669, a reduction of 70.32%. Now, that is pretty good. But is it the smallest? No, obviously. It's <laughs> gzip turned up to 9. Uh, sorry, zlib turned up to 9, uh, compressing it. We'll bring it all the way down to 80,268. <laughs> a solid win of 400 bytes there. <laughs> All right, so I was a little disappointed with this. Uh, and, you know, that obviously changes by the file and the size of the file you're compressing and all things like that. But in this particular test, we made it smaller. And you know smaller is always better. We are sending less bytes over the wire. We are going to get there quicker. Uh, in the thousands and millions of page views I send, I will save myself so much bandwidth. Smaller is clearly better. But could we do better than that? You see, Zlib has been around for a long time. And uh, whilst it is very efficient at zipping files up, making them smaller, it's not the best at making them the smallest. And uh, getting involved in this uh, a, a number of years back were, were a couple of Google engineers who were trying to make compression better for Google, which seems reasonable. They have quite a bit more traffic than I do. Uh, and so they invented um, it was a new algorithm to take text files and turn them into gzip format, uh, but smaller. They invented Zopfly. I hope you, uh, you might have heard of it before. It came out in February of 2013, and um, Zopfly is, is brilliant. It, it, conf uh, it conforms to the same format 
that, uh, that, that gzip does, or that zlib does. It writes to the same kind of file. And that means in your browser, uh, nothing has to change. Uh, it's still able to um, re-expand, to reflate those files. The problem with Zotfli is it's 80 times slower than zlib. But it can make the files 3 to 8% smaller. So as an over-engineering owner of a statically generated site that had a little bit of time on my hands, it was new gem time. <laughs> Thankfully, this one was quite a lot of copying and pasting, um, because everything was the same except for this bit. Uh, because uh, there is, of course, already a gem out there for Zopfly itself. It wraps the C extension, um, or it wraps the C library, uh, and, uh, and does almost exactly the same. It actually can provide gzip or deflate uh, formats, so I put it into gzip, uh, and it looks exactly the same. And I bet you're wondering, what were the results? Oh, the important thing, of course, is, yeah, Zotfleet is 80 times slower than Zlib, but it doesn't matter, because this is done at build time for the site. You can't put Zotfleet into Nginx and say, do this on the fly, because you will waste much more time uh, on the compression than you will saving it over the wire. But you're probably wondering, what does this look like when you compress jQuery? Well, remember we saved ourselves a good 0.08% when we turned up Zlib, well, turning it to Zopli, we got ourselves down to 76,352 bytes. Not bad, another 1.5% saving. Not as much as I thought it would be, which is pretty much the theme of this talk. <laughs> but it's good. Zopli is getting better. And because we can do it ahead of time, it doesn't cost us anything at the time of actually requesting a page or requesting an asset. Uh, we've made the file smaller and smaller is always better. You've seen the pictures of the dog, you know. But was that... Oh, so, having implemented this, uh, it was then important to actually tell Nginx about it for myself. Of course, if you're using Apache or any other kind of server, you can do this as well. This is just my experience. Um, turning gzip off meant this would now stop uh, Nginx doing any work to try and zip things up. Uh, and then there's an extension to uh, serve gzip static. And so if you saw in the code, what we did was create a file uh, that just has a .gz uh, extra extension on it. And gzip static for Nginx will uh, look for that. And if it's there, serve that instead. It's smaller, it's better. But was that enough? Still probably not. And it wasn't just for me. Those same engineers that worked on Zopfly to improve the um, improve the compression for Google, they did everything they could to wring everything out of the performance of, of gzip in its format. But in doing so, I think they discovered ways to do it better. And so later in 2013, they actually re released uh, an entirely new um, compression format uh, and library to do that compression, uh, which is Brotly. Uh, I really like the names of this, actually. Brotly just means small bread. Uh, I don't know why bread. They, maybe they were hungry when they were rating these, but um, they released Brotly. Brotly is an entirely new uh, format, uh, a new file. Uh, and so now if a browser sends you the accept encoding header with BR, you know you can serve Brotly back to it. Of course, in 2013, there weren't any browsers sending this, but we're in 2019 now. And so making things smaller uh, and, and sending them to those browsers is possible. That's why it's important to think about it and keep talking about it. Because this is actually, yeah, this is today's support for Brotly and browsers, uh, pretty much across the board. Uh, your red larks there are uh, IE, Opera Mini, and BlackBerry. I don't know why they still show BlackBerry browser on there. I don't know anybody using it anymore. But uh, Brotly is, is basically available across the board. So we have this better compression format uh, and, a, and, a, a, and a smaller file size that we can send. There is one caveat, you do have to, uh, you can't use Brotly in a browser unless you're serving your website over HTTPS. Whole bunches of new web features uh, require you to have HTTPS these days, and with the uh, existence of fantastic tools like uh, Let's Encrypt, uh, we should all be endeavoring to uh, move our sites to uh, secure uh, to HTTPS so that we can take advantage of these things. Also, HTTP2 doesn't work without HTTPS. So it's a it's kind of no-brainer to uh, secure your website like that. 
So of course, we have this Brotley and, and I've got these other GZIP things. It was obviously new gem time. I've been over-engineering this so much. Why not have another gem? So in comes Jekyll Brotley. And this is great because it does exactly the same thing as all the other things, except we have the Brotley library in there instead. Uh, and, uh, and one more. Um, of course, what does jQuery do with it? Well, when we compress unminified jQuery with Brotley at level six, uh, we get it down to a almost disappointingly 75,302 bytes. It's another point three, it's a third of a percent. Oh dear. But that's quality six, that's the default. The best thing about Brotley, and I really hope the developers of this were thinking about Spinal Tap at the time, is that they put in 11 different levels. And so, <laughs> Obviously, because we're doing this ahead of time, it doesn't matter how long it takes. I wanted to turn it up to 11. And we can do that with the quality parameter just over there. It's cool. Turning up to 11 brings it in at 66,920. We've added another 3% on top of classic Brotley uh, and another 5% uh, on top of regular GZIP. Oh, I've saved so many bytes. 14,000 almost in total. That's a, that's a window. That's a f uh, frame size in HTTP, isn't it? <sighs> Pretty exciting, right? <laughs> So as part of the description for this talk, I also uh, said how I got into a fight uh, with a CDN. You see, what happened was, I did all this work. I, it's not a lot of code. There was more work in writing a testing framework for it. Um, I did all this work, and I wanted to test whether it was going to improve things. And so before I actually implemented uh, Jekyll Brotley into my site and deployed it and changed Nginx to, to serve it, I wanted to go and see what my site was already, uh, what was already returning, and see how much better I was going to be. And I opened up the browser, and I checked in the, uh, the network panel, and I was already sending Brotly encoded files, which was a surprise to me, and probably something I should have checked hours, days, weeks before I started on this. You see, it turned out, as I said earlier, I was using a CDN to, store, to serve this site, and uh, CDNs, of course, are, are brilliant. They put your, uh, put your files all around the internet so they can be closer to your users as they want to request them, uh, so that your site is no longer limited by the speed of, uh, speed of light. Uh, I use oops, Cloudflare uh, for, uh, for mine. It's, it's free for your personal sites and things like that, and I think it's great. And it turned out they were already doing the Brotley encoding for me. Which, you know, um, is kind of cool of them, right? I didn't have to think about this. I mean, they are doing it on the fly, and they're not using quality 11. <sighs> so, so I thought, now they're getting in my way. They're breaking my, uh, my utterly minified, tiny little site and doing it themselves. And so when I say we got into a fight, it was really kind of a fight. I raised a ticket to say, hey, can I serve my own Brotly things? It turns out what they do, actually, is, is strip the accept encoding header uh, out of the original request and just set it to gzip. So admittedly, uh, in turning on my Zopfly integration, uh, I was sending smaller gzip files over to um, uh, Cloudflare, but I could never serve them Brotly, my minified quality 11 Brotly. Uh, and uh, I could have got mad about this. I could have gone on the internet, but I, I decided not to. I decided to submit a talk about it instead. Uh, <laughs> they're not doing wrong. They're actually doing very well. In, in fact, you know, providing Brotly for everybody that, can, uh, that serves via the CDN is a great idea. And there are other CDNs out there that will not strip the accept encoding header and will allow you to serve up your own files. And so uh, maybe I should just, if I really care about it, move to that. But you know, in my mind, it was a fight, and I lost. So there are some takeaways for this. I still believe that smaller things are always better, and making things smaller shouldn't be something you have to think about. And so if you have a Jekyll site that you're hosting, and you want to use any of these gems, they exist up there. They are also uh, useful if you happen to, uh, if, you're, if you have a Jekyll site which you host on, say, uh, Amazon S3, uh, which can serve gzip files for you. So if you just zip them all up with Jekyll Zopfly, uh, then there'll be the smallest possible files that AWS will serve for you, which is pretty cool. But you thinking maybe I have a Rails application, uh, what can we do about that? Uh, in Rails 5 or anything that is sprockets based, um, it actually already supports um, 
generating files with a uh, with a Zopfly uh, if you want to. Um, so if you uh, if you in your Rails app, Rails five application include the Zopfly gem and then in your application config set uh, assets.gzip to Zopfly, it will just use Zopfly instead, and and it will all be amazing. There's not actually a lot uh, for Brotly uh, out there to do it, uh, but the Sprockets exporters pack uh, will uh, pre-render Brotly uh, files for you as well, uh, giving you that ability to, uh, to serve up the smallest site you can, the smallest assets, at least, in this you can. Rails 6, of course, is now Webpacker by default. Uh, and the JavaScript community, as we spoke earlier, uh, I, I, I spend time in JavaScript as well. Um, and uh, the Zotfly and Brotly Webpack plugins are just right there and ready to help you out in this case uh, with almost minimal configuration. JavaScript land is not quite the uh, convention over configuration world that the Ruby one is, but uh, with a small amount of config, we can achieve the same thing. Now, there's one more thing. So I've spoken all of this time about uh, uh, text files. But of course, they're not the biggest thing that we serve uh, as part of our uh, web applications. Uh, constantly, images are, are the greatest one. And I just wanted to throw this in at the end, because it's not kind of not released yet or anything, but um, much the same as Google spent all that time working on compressing text files smaller, they've also produced better image formats since. Uh, and uh, web, oh, images, yes, that. Uh, and, uh, and the one that has taken hold across the, uh, across the web has been WebP. Uh, it's brilliant, because it supports both uh, lossless and lossy compression and animation. Uh, so it's JPEG, PNG, and GIF all in one, and smaller than any of them. So uh, <laughs> it's not quite new gem time yet. I haven't got this quite figured out. Uh, it's working on my site, but uh, we can actually go and take all the images from a Jekyll site, or if you were to do Rails, you could do this the same, uh, and encode them to WebP. Um, and like I said, there's a, there's a difference between lossy and lossless. So in this case, uh, if the extension's PNG, we can encode it uh, with the lossless uh, settings and at the top quality, because it's lossless, we can make it as small as possible. Uh, and if it's uh, a JPEG or, or, a, or a GIF, then uh, we, can, we can pick a quality, very similar to JPEG qualities. Um, this, uh, this does work on my site. Its only problem is that every time I run the site, it does all of the images. So it takes about 20 minutes for me to build my site right now, which is why I haven't released this yet. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> we'll get there. There's, uh, there's some new caching stuff in Jekyll 4, which just came out. So uh, I'll, be, uh, I'll be looking into how to make that actually workable for anybody. Um, but being able to, uh, to do this, and then, of course, serving the images. Um, now we have a JPEG and PNG and a WebP version of all the images. Uh, and so uh, my Nginx settings need a bit of an update. And this is a little bit more complicated than just gzip on and gzip static on. Um, in this particular case, we actually create a, uh, a, a variable um, based on whether um, the accept, uh, HTTP accept header includes WebP. If it does, uh, add to this WebP suffix to the HTTP accept uh, ooh, no, sorry, add uh, webp to the webp suffix variable. Uh, and then for all my assets there, um, we just try to see if that exists. Otherwise, fall back to the existing image. Otherwise, fall back to 404. It actually works quite nicely uh, until somebody tries to download one of your images, because it's only browsers that dis uh, actually show who webp images. Uh, they download it to their operating system, and the OS is like, I don't, I don't know what this is. Uh, but it works really well for the web, and it makes things smaller. And as I said, smaller is always better. I wanted to actually finally finish with the results of my work on uh, my entire site itself. Did it make it quicker? Did it pass the? Uh, did it pass Lighthouse's tests? Well, firstly, uh, I wanted to do the table of compression. This time against all text files uh, on my website, uncompressed. It's apparently 1.8 meg, which almost surprised me. It's Apparently, I've been writing blog posts uh, using Jekyll's Opfly. We brought that down to just over 500,000 bytes, which I thought was pretty good. 72% reduction for the whole thing. It's amazing. And then using Brotly, very much less. I think I've done something wrong here. I'm a little bit concerned. Um, there is uh, one thing where particularly small files can actually increase in size if you use Brotly, so it's a, a good idea not to compress everything and maybe uh, throw some sort of... Um, 
a threshold uh, in front of that, and that's something to add to the gem. Uh, similarly, uh, if it's not compressed it by uh, enough, then it's probably worth uh, not compressing as well, because the work to decompress it will also make it slower, even though it's very fast and optimized. And then I checked Lighthouse. I was like, I must have done this now. Did I get that extra one? No. <laughs> Not at the time, anyway. And I wanted, to, uh, I wanted to close by switching over to Chrome. And this is my website right here. And this is Lighthouse here in the Audits tab on uh, Chrome, uh, in the Chrome DevTools. And it's going to audit my site right now. And let's see what we get. It's got to 100 now, and I didn't change anything. <laughs> So performance tools can be interesting, can be flaky, uh, can give you weird results, but there's nothing, uh, there's nothing you can do wrong if you're making your files smaller and serving them to your people quicker. There are easy ways to do it in Ruby, uh, and, uh, and I just want you to remember uh, that yes, smaller is indeed always better. And just to finish with one final proof about how tiny dogs are always better, here's my dog pretending to be a large prawn. <laughs> So that's it. My name's Phil Nash. Uh, I am here for the rest of the day, loving uh, being in Bangkok. Uh, as I said, I work for Twilio. Come and ask me about that. And otherwise, enjoy the rest of the conference. And thank you very much.